Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So today we're going to be looking a little bit more at the work of the amazing Mr. Fogg. And today I wanted to introduce the VCL or Vector Class Library. So what is the Vector Class Library? Well, it's SIMD without assembly and without intrinsics. That's good. So what is SIMD? Okay, so a little introduction to SIMD. So SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. Uh, it's a set of instructions in the hardware for optimized or uh, performance programming. And SIMD basically works on what's called vectors. So SIMD vectors are actually just small arrays. You can see here that I've drawn out an array of eight floating point values. So this is an example just here of a SIMD vector. And this is an example of VCL's VEC8F, incidentally. It's just an array of eight floating point elements. But the thing is, in SIMD, the CPU, the hardware itself, can operate on all eight elements at once. So here we can see a little uh, SIMD addition. So you'll see here that we've got vectors A, B, and C. And what we're saying is that C equals A plus B. So often what you get in SIMD programming is you get corresponding elements to have this little operation performed. So in this case, it's addition. So what we would have there is that uh, each of the corresponding elements from vector A are added to the corresponding elements of vector B and the result is stored in vector C. What we get is 1.9 plus 4.4 equals 6.3. And we get 2.5 plus 2.1 equals 4.6. Yada, 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 all the way across the vector. But the good thing about SIMD is that this operation happens at once. And this is where SIMD gets its extraordinary performance from. So SIMD is a type of parallelism, um, something like, um, something like multi-threading. Yeah, it's a different type of uh, parallelism. So the thing about SIMD is that we provide one instruction. So in this example, it's addition. And the same instruction is performed on multiple data, single instruction, multiple data. <laughs> okay, so that's what SIMD basically is. We'll have a bit of a look in code at that same example pretty much in just a little bit. But why VCL? Why the vector class library? So SIMD is crucial to modern high performance code and there's a couple of ways to do SIMD. Uh, for one thing, you can use assembly or the language of the hardware. But the trouble with using assembly language is that the C++ compiler can't optimize across your function calls. So it can't inline your hand coded assembly. And the other thing is that uh, the C++ compiler won't uh, optimize your assembly code at all. Yeah, so you sort of lose a lot of the benefits to having uh, an optimizing compiler when you go to hand code assembly. So another option for coding these amazing SIMD instructions is called intrinsics or compiler intrinsics. But the trouble with uh, compiler intrinsics is that the syntax is really quite complicated and fiddly. It's really difficult to read and maintain. So the VCL offers a third alternative. It's easy to debug and maintain. It's easy to read uh, VCL code, really. It's also compiler friendly, so you'll still get uh, your functions will be optimized and things like that where, where possible uh, with the compiler. So VCL actually offers a clear and uh, easy to debug and maintain alternative to all of those things. Okay, so a little bit of a rundown of the vector class library before we jump into coding with this stuff. Uh, the vector class library offers SIMD vectors of 128 bits, 256 bits and 512 bits. Uh, so it offers integers sizes from uh, eight bit bytes all the way up to 64 bits, which is uh, C++ long longs, or what do they call them in assembly or quad words. It also offers IEEE floating point values, so 32 bits and 64 bit doubles. So instruction sets will be emulated with VCL uh, where they're not available in the hardware. So if I've only got AVX2, then uh, my hardware can still emulate AVX512, which is quite cool. Uh, VCL offers a lot of advanced mathematical functions. I think this is actually a lifesaver, really. I mean, these things are fiddly to code often. Things like powers, logs, and trig functions. Uh, a lot of these things are not native to the hardware, but um, there's uh, optimized routines provided in VCL. Um, so very fast performance. The operations are often compiled down to single instructions, just like um, intrinsics or assembly instructions. Okay, so now we're going to have a bit of a demonstration on how to actually install and use the VCL. So there's a couple of things that you have to do, and there's also a couple of ways that you can use the library. Ultimately, the objective is to include this file just here, the main header, vectorclass.h, uh, but also give your project access to all of the headers in the library. So the first thing that we might do is just set up a little project. Uh, I'm going to be using Visual Studio 2019. 
uh, we've got to set up a new C++ project. So I'll just click Create New Project. And we'll go Language C++. I'll select an empty project. And then I'll click Next. And for the name of my project, I might call it Agna Fog VCL. And we'll click Create. Uh, okay, so here we are in a new project. So one of the first things that you want to make sure is that uh, you're compiling for 64 bits. So click on the little arrow up here and select x64. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is just add a main file. Uh, I right clicked on my project just up here in the Solution Explorer and we come down to Add and we click New Item. And I'll just call it Main. Okay, so the reason that we do this is because we want Visual Studio to create a source folder for us. So the next thing that we might do is we might go into the project's properties. So you can go up to debug and come down to the project's properties just here. And we've got to select the instruction set and the C++ standard. Okay, so we click uh, C++ just here. We come down to code generation. And you'll see here, Enable Enhanced Instruction Set. Now, by default, that's not set. So what we want to do for uh, VCL, you need SSE2 as a minimum. Uh, or you can select some of the others like AVX or AVX2. Now, the instruction set that you're selecting is actually to do with the, the hardware. So what sort of hardware you want your code to run on. Uh, if you select SSE2, then your code will run on pretty much every x86 CPU since about the year 2000 or 2001. Uh, that's when SSE2 actually came out. Uh, but if you only want your program to run on more modern hardware, then you can select AVX or AVX2. AVX and AVX2 actually have 256-bit registers. So what you'll find is that your code will generally run a lot faster uh, if you can select a more modern instruction set, your AVX or AVX2. Uh, but your code won't run on older CPUs. Yeah, so select SSE2 if you want sort of slightly slower code, uh, but code that will run on all hardware, or select AVX or AVX2 if you want your code to run fast on more modern hardware. Now, there is another option, which is not quite mainstream yet, but this is AVX512. So VCL is also optimized for uh, AVX512, which hasn't quite hit mainstream yet. Uh, just keep that in mind that there is uh, another instruction set coming along, which has uh, 512. 12 bit vectors. Okay, so what I might do for uh, for my hardware in this particular machine here, I know that it has AVX2, so I might just select AVX2. Okay, the other thing that you've got to do is select the C++ standard. Now, the C++ standard that's required for VCL is actually C++17. So come here to uh, language and then C++ language standard. Then you want to click on the little arrow and specify uh, ISO C++17. And then we click apply. Let me just make sure that that code generation is applied as well. Yes, it is. And then we click OK. OK, so that's just a little bit about prepping up our project. You want to select X64. You want to select the instruction set, which is SSE2 or above. And you also want to select the C++ ISO. OK, so the next step is to actually download the... Uh, vector class library itself. So I'll leave a link in the video description to the GitHub where you can get the latest version. And uh, you'll see something like this page just here. So the latest version is version two. It came out, I don't know, a month or two ago. And uh, what you want to do is really download the manual and uh, just keep that handy as a reference. Uh, you also want to download the source code. So I might just uh, control and click on the manual and we'll select OK to save that. And I'll control and click on the source code as well. And we'll click OK to save that. Okay, so the next thing that you want to do is navigate to the folder where that downloaded. Uh, on my particular machine, that's D drive and downloads. You want to find the zip file and you want to unzip that somewhere. So I might just right click. I have uh, seven zip installed on this computer. Yeah, so I just extracted that here to this little folder just here. And if we double click on that, we should see the library itself. So the library is just a series of headers. There's a, a CPP file here, a change log, yeah, a license and a readme that you can have a bit of a look at. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is explore two methods of including that header, vectorclass.h, in your project. Uh, the first method is just to copy the files from the library, to copy those into the source uh, folder of your project. So if I just hit Control A and then Control C, to copy all of those files. Then we come over to our projects folder. 
Uh, this might be in different places depending on how you've set up your particular machine. But um, my project just here, Agnafog VCL, if I double click on that folder and then double click on this folder, what you'll see just there is the main.cpp file that we created. So you know that that's the source code folder of your project. So if I just hit control V to paste all of the contents of the zip into that folder, then if we come to our project, we should be able to include vector class dot H. Yeah, there we go. So that's one way to uh, include the vector class dot H uh, library file. Uh, I might just uh, add a few more things while we're here. I'll go IO stream and we'll int main and return zero. Okay, so that's one way to include the vector class just there, is just to copy all of the source files from that zip into your project folder. But the other way to do it, if I just delete that line just there and click save, and we come over to here and I just uh, control Z for a second. Uh, okay, so I've just deleted all of the files from my project source folder. So the other thing that you can do is actually set up a library folder on your computer somewhere and then just reuse the uh, source code files uh, again and again. Okay, so let's have a bit of a look at how to do that. Okay, so I'm here on my D drive. I might just right click and select new and I'll make a new folder. I'll call it libs. And then we'll double click on that. I'll make a new folder and I'll call it VCL for vector class library. I'll double click on that and I'll paste the contents of the vector class library zip file into that folder. Now this folder here we can reuse again and again so long as we set up the additional include directories in our project. So let's have a bit of a look at that. Okay, so we'll come over to our project, we'll go up to debug and uh, properties again. So what we've got to do here is uh, just instruct Visual Studio to uh, look in specific paths for headers when it needs to find them. So there's a couple of ways to do this. You can change it here in VC++ directories. Now uh, you can uh, add the folder up here to include directories. Or the other way to do it is uh, to come to general just here in the C++ little sub thing <laughs> and uh, come up here to additional include directories and we can specify the path to the folder that we just made uh, here. Okay, so we'll click on the little arrow just here and then we'll click edit. And then we'll click on the new folder button and then dot, dot, dot. And we've got to find the folder that we just made. So on my machine, it was the D drive, libs, VCL, and that's it. So I'll click select folder, okay, and apply. Then if we click okay, what we should be able to do is include vector class dot h. Okay, so that's two different ways to include the vector class library uh, in your project. Now what we might do is just run through that little addition example that we saw in the slides, just to make sure that everything is up and running okay. So I might just declare two vectors, a and b. Uh, we'll make them 8f, I'll call it a. And we'll just set it to the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we'll make another vector, 8f, and we'll call it b. And I might set this one to, I don't know, 4, 3, 4, 3. It doesn't really matter. Just a little example. Then we'll say vec 8f c equals a plus b. Oh, whoops, that should be an uppercase a. Okay, and I'll put a breakpoint just here on return so that we can uh, see if uh, our library is up and running. Uh, everything seems to be building just fine. Okay, and we've got control again. Let's just uh, have a bit of a watch on this C vector just here. Okay, here's our watch just here. Okay, and there is the values of the C vector. So vector C has the numbers uh, 5, 5, 7, 7, 9, 9, 11, 11. 1 plus 1, oh sorry, 1 plus 4 gives you 5. Uh, 2 plus 3 gives you 5. 3 plus 4 gives you 7, yada, 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 all the way up to 8 plus 3, which gives you 11. So the C vector just here is the result of adding together the corresponding elements of the A and the B vector. That's SIMD. Yeah, and it's all happened at once. 
So the CPU will actually perform all eight of these additions at once and give us, hopefully anyway, really good performance. <laughs> okay, so everything seems to be up and running. Um, okay, so just a little bit of a rundown on the data types in the VCL. Yeah, so these are all the VCL data types just here. So your VEC 16C is a, a little vector of 16 characters. Uh, or you've got something like VEC 8US, where the U means unsigned. Yeah, so if you want to store, say, eight unsigned short integers, then you would use VEC US, etc., etc. Uh, so this one right here, VEC 16I, would be a vector of 16 integers. Yeah, hope that makes a bit of sense. So where your hardware doesn't have the capable instruction set, say my hardware doesn't have uh, AVX 512, the VCL will actually use AVX2 instructions whenever I code 512-bit uh, vectors. Yeah, it will just use a couple of uh, AVX2 instructions to emulate AVX 512. Quite cool. Okay, and the floating point data types. So we've only got two floating point data types. We've got floats or single precision floats, and we've also got doubles. So these are IEEE floats, IEEE 754. And if we're using 128-bit vectors, then we can store up to four floats or up to two doubles in our vectors. If we're using 256-bit vectors, then we can do uh, up to eight single precision floats or four doubles. And then we've got 512-bit vectors where we can st store up to 16 floating point values or up to eight double precision floating point numbers. Um, okay, so moving along, we've also got Boolean types, but I think we'll have a look at these a bit later. So this is for uh, conditions. Yeah, sort of emulating branching and that sort of thing. Yeah, the Boolean vector types, but we can have a bit of a look at that later. Uh, here's a couple of illustrations of the vectors. So this is 128-bit vectors. Um, we could do VEC 16C or VEC 16UC for characters, and there's 16 little characters just there. Or we could do VEC 8S or VEC 8US for unshort integers. Um, we've got VEC 4 for uh, integers, VEC 2 for quad words, and then the floating point vectors down here. I should move this little dude across. The 256-bit vector sizes. Alrighty, so now we've got 32 bytes at once. Uh, up to 16 short instructions can be performed at once, SIMD style. Up to 8 32-bit or int instructions can be performed at once. We could store 4 quad words or 64-bit integers. We could do 8 single precision operations at once using VEC8F. Or we could do up to 4 double precision floating point operations at once using 256-bit vectors. And finally, the big 512-bit vectors. So this is this is amazing, really. Uh, you can perform up to 64 character operations at once using 512-bit vectors. Uh, you could perform 32 operations on short integers or 16-bit integers. You could perform 16 operations on integers at once, SIMD style. You could do eight quad word operations, 16 floating point operations, or eight double precision floating point operations. Absolutely amazing, 512-bit vectors. Okay, let's have a bit of a look at the constructors. So in order to call a constructor, first of all, we've got the default constructor. If I just hit, um, if we just clear this, and we could do something like uh, vec8i, and just call it my vec. Yeah, so that's the default constructor there. Um, that's uninitialized. Yeah, so don't, don't count on that being initialized to zero or anything. That's just an uninitialized default constructor. Uh, if we supply a single value, say four, uh, right here for my little eight integer vector. That's actually going to do what's called a broadcast. That's going to set all of the elements to the same value, which is four in this case. Uh, likewise, you can do this if you want. Uh, my vec equals seven. Yeah, so if we set a vector to a value, it's actually going to broadcast or set all of the elements to the same value. Let's have a bit of a run and see if um, what I'm talking about is actually true. Okay, so when you're looking at the watch just here, you do want to be careful that you're looking at the right one. So here I've got um, integers or I32, 32-bit integers. So if we just expand that, we can see that we got this seven broadcast to all elements. Good stuff. Okay, so a constructor with a single value is going to broadcast that value to all elements. Likewise, if you use the equals operator, then that's also going to broadcast um, this value just here to all elements of your vector. Okay, another constructor, if you want to supply all of the values for your vector, so let's make a vec, um, I might make it 4f floating point values, and we'll just say like float vec. 
Uh, if you supply a value for each of the elements, say 1.0 f, 2.0 f, 3.0 f, and 4.0 f, then this constructor is going to set the elements of your vector to those values. Yeah, there's another way of doing this too. You can go like um, vec 4f, doesn't really matter what it's called, equals vec uh, 4f. Yeah, same, same sort of thing there. So we'll just get all of the elements of our vector set to the values that we supply. So this vector just here will be set to one, two, three, and four. If we just hit run and get our watch window up to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, so F32 is the single precision floats. So we just expand that down. We can see that our elements of our vector are set to one, two, three, four, which happens quite nicely to coincide with the values that we passed in the constructor. Uh, okay, so something else interesting that you can do is set each half in the constructor. So if you supply a vec8i, for instance, with um, two vec4i's, then VCL is actually going to set the upper and lower halves. Yeah, so that's quite interesting too. Okay, so setting data. All right, so, okay, so setting data or loading data. If we've got ourselves a float array... like that whoops okay so if we've got ourselves a float array then we can load data into our vector using the load instruction so if we've got vec 4f and we just say like uh, my vector then what we can do is say my vector dot load whoops lowercase and arr -R. now what that's going to do is read however many elements from the array fit into the vector so in this case we've got a vec 4f so that's going to load this uh, one, two, three, and four into our vector. Let's just hit run and see if it does. Okay, we'll just get rid of these watches here. And we'll add a watch here. Yeah, so you can see just there that our vector loaded or read from the array the one, two, and three, and four. So that's the four elements that fits into our vector. If we just hit stop, something else cool that you can do is uh, a bit of pointer arithmetic. If we say um, A double R plus three, uh, what that's going to do is start loading from the third element. So the one just here is zero, the two is one, the three is two, and the four is element number three. So if we load from A double R plus three, what's going to happen is that these four elements just here, four, five, six, and seven, will be read into our vector. <laughs> Yeah, there they are, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so the standard rules for pointer arithmetic apply. Okay, so another operation that you can do is insert. So if you just want to insert a single value into a particular position in your vector, then you could say my vector uh, dot insert, and then the index, which we might say index number two, and the value we'll insert is 100. Yeah, so this is just going to set the second element or the element at position two. It's zero based um, indexing uh, to the value 100. So let's just see what we got. We should get something like four, five, 107, I think. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, four, five, 107. Yeah, so insert just lets you change a single value in your vector. It is worth pointing out that you can't do this. Oops. Yeah, so the array operator is overloaded for reading values, but not for writing them. Yeah, so that's illegal. Yeah, you have to use insert. Uh, okay, another couple of operations. We've got load partial, which is interesting. That just loads a couple of elements and it zeroes the remaining elements. And we've also got cut off uh, function, which zeroes elements from N and above. Okay, that's setting data. Let's have a quick look at how you get data. Um, one way to do that is to store in an array. So... So if we set our vector here and we set it to something like um, 9, 8, 7, that, like that. If we want to store the vector, my vector, in the array, then we call uh, myVec.store and we pass a double R as a parameter. So this is going to store 9, 8, 7, and 6 over the first four elements of this array just here. Let's just run and see what happens. And we'll get a bit of a watch going on this little fella. How you going, A double R? He's going pretty good. He's got nine, eight, seven, six as the first four elements, which is what we just stored just then. And then he's got the rest of the array, which is unchanged. So once again, you can actually use pointer arithmetic here if you wanted like um, plus four. 
Um, ARR plus four is going to start storing at the fourth uh, index of ARR. Yeah, good stuff. Store. Um, so one of the most convenient ways to read a single value is that the array operator or the square brackets is actually overloaded. So we could do uh, my vector and say element number three. Some float equals that. Yeah, so this is going to read uh, the third element or the element at index number three into some float. So index number three is the six just there. Yeah, so it'd be the same as setting some float to six. Let's see. Some float six. There you go. Yeah, so we want to read number two. That'd be the seven just there. Or we could read number one, which would be the eight. Or index number zero is the nine. Um, okay, so another couple of interesting operations. We've got uh, store partial, which actually just stores a couple of elements in an array and then leaves the rest unchanged. Uh, we've also got um, get low and get high, which will actually store the lower or the upper half of a larger vector into smaller vectors or vectors of half the size. Uh, gather. Okay, so this is really, really cool. So gather actually allows us to do, well, the gather operation, which is um, random access. We can specify which elements from an array we want to store in our vector. Let's have a bit of an example. I think this is fantastic. Um, okay, so we might change from float ARR. Let's make an integer array. I might just say um, int. I'll call it ARR again because I'm not very creative. And we'll say that it equals all of these amazing numbers and a one on the end. So if we make a vec 8i, then what we're saying is we want a little uh, array of eight integers. And we might just call this uh, vec and we'll say gather 8i, something like that. Okay. Whoops, I put an extra little. So what gather is going to do is uh, store the eight elements specified by the indices in the triangle brackets. So one just here will be the first element of our vector, that's the 23 just there, or the element of ARR that's at index number one. And the four just here will be zero, one, two, three, four. The four will be that seven. Yeah, so we're just picking and choosing which values from the array uh, we want and uh, storing them in our vector. Yeah, so you can see here, there's a little bit of an illustration. So we've got this array just here and then the indices specified in the gather instruction are picking and choosing which elements from that array to store in the vector. Uh, so one final thing before we end up, you can uh, you can call the size uh, function just here, yeah, the size member function to actually loop through your vectors. So we might just do one final little uh, demonstration and loop through the values in this vector here that we've gathered from the array. Let's see, for int i equals zero, well i is less than vec dot size i plus plus and let's see out those bad boys i might just std first because the compiler's not going to know cat what are you talking about uh your guess is good as mine the element number i is set to and vec i So the size member function returns the element count or the number of elements in your vector. So right here, that would be eight. Yeah, since we've got a vec eight i. Let's just hit run and see if we get the elements that we gathered. Yeah, there you go. Vec zero is set to 23. So 23 was um, this one just here. Uh, vec one is set to, sorry, element number one is set to seven right there. Element two is set to one, since that was uh, index number three of the array. Element five is set to 89. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So we've just uh, gathered random or arbitrary element indices from our array. And then using the size method, we can uh, count up and print out each of the elements of our vector. Okay, so I'll be putting these slides up that we're going through here for the Patreons, just as a big thank you for supporting the channel. Uh, I'm going to supply links to Agnafog's webpage and the Vector Class Library latest version from GitHub down in the video description. And I just want to say thank you very much for watching and thank you very much for your excellent work, Mr. Fog. You're a legend. <laughs> all right, thanks for watching all. Have a good one. Adios.